Two of the most iconic gaming franchises of all time are Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. Today, for this video, we're going to focus on the new product, Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. This merges and blends the D&D universe with Magic the Gathering. This video is intended for new players to Magic the Gathering. I'm going to walk you through basic deck building strategies. Here is the roadmap for new players to follow when creating their first Magic the Gathering decks. First off, use a 60 card deck, period. Do not depart from this. I'll go through why a little bit later. Next, you're going to be selecting 22 basic lands, 11 of each type. You're going to pick two of the basic colors and add 11 of each of those. Next, and I see this as quite an issue for new players, they get kind of confused with so many different card types to pick. Oftentimes, they're very sorcery and instant, sort of heavy in their deck, or they have a lot of enchantments. What I recommend new players do is focus on having 30 creature cards in your deck, and that's a great way to learn combat and the mechanics around how creatures fight one another. Finally, you're going to be adding eight different spells of any other type. These could be artifacts, enchantments, sorceries, and instants. And once again, this is a basic roadmap for that first time that you put that deck together. And then in the future, after you get to know your deck a little bit better, you can tweak it and modify it as needed. As a quick tip, use a 60 card magic deck when you're playing just in general. I find that you want to play 60 card decks all the time with no exception. And the reason why is that you're going to get the cards that you want to play. Oftentimes when I see new players, they have these hefty, massive decks that are 100 cards or more. And in decks like this, you can't really get the cards that you're looking for and you get kind of an inconsistent play style out of it. So when you're building a deck, the more copies of something you have, the more consistent your deck is gonna be. So stick with a 60 card deck, it's a lot more manageable. In addition, people can't even shuffle these large decks. So when they start to actually shuffle, they start making a mess of the deck. In addition to that, the land does not get distributed evenly through the deck, and they have some serious mana problems when they play the game. Always stick with 60 card decks. In general, with Magic the Gathering, the more common a card is, the cheaper it is, and the easier it will be for you to get multiple copies of that card. It's extremely important when you're building a deck to have as many replicates of that card as possible. What this is going to do is stabilize your deck. It's going to be very consistent. If you have, let's say, 30 different creatures in your deck and you put one of each into your deck, it's going to be kind of fun to play, but it's going to be very, very inconsistent. You're not going to be able to get the cards that you need when you need it, and there's no way for you to build a defined strategy. So first and foremost, let's talk about what that looks like in the game, um, at least on modern Magic cards the rarity is listed on the card. So here we have a black and white symbol, and then C is listed at the bottom left of the card. Next we have uncommon with this silver and black symbol, and then a U is listed on the card as well. When we move up into the rare category, uh, you're gonna have this gold symbol, and then the letter R written in the bottom left-hand corner. And then finally with mythic, you're gonna have this orange symbol, and there's gonna be an M on the bottom left-hand portion of that card. There are cards in the game that say legendary, and if you look, it'll say legendary in the card type section. So in this case, we have two different legendary creatures. Now, with these creatures, just know that you can only have one copy present in the game, and that can be for both players at any one given time. So when you're doing deck construction and deck building, maybe put one copy or at most two copies in of legendary creatures into your deck if it's essential for your strategy. And just please note that if you do get those additional replicates, you won't be able to put them into play until the other one leaves play. When deck building, start with common cards. In general, you're gonna have the most number of these cards. The kind of the rule is you can only have up to four of any one given card in the deck. So start with your common ones. So in this case, we have four Manticores. They're very cheap and easy to buy. When I mean easy to buy, be money-wise, if you go to your local game store, a lot of times common cards are very, very cheap. You know, sometimes one penny, five pennies at most, so five cents. This really isn't a huge cost when you're putting your deck together. 
Magic can be somewhat cost prohibitive if you start purchasing booster box after booster box after booster box. So what I recommend for new players is go to your local Magic store and get a pile of common cards. As an example, there's a local store near where I live and you can purchase 400 common cards of any one given color plus they give you 30 land of that color and that costs you 10 bucks. So that's a great way to sort of get into the game. So let's say you purchase one color and then you buy another one. So for 20 bucks, you get all the land that you need for your deck. In addition to that, what they're also going to give you is a bunch of commons, and this is going to help you build the base of your deck. As you move into uncommon cards, they're going to be a little bit more pricey, a little bit more costly at your local store. Um, and if you're opening booster boxes, you're just going to have less of them just based upon the rarity and the frequency of which they appear in the booster packs. So as an example, we have the Drider up on the screen. These are uncommon, so maybe when I'm putting the first deck together, I'm going to say, you know what, I don't have a ton of these Driders, but they're pretty cool. I like their effects, so I'm going to throw three of them into the deck. Uh, when you go to your local gaming store, these will be sometimes moderately more expensive, and it all depends upon what you're looking for. It can be extremely daunting when you start getting into the game. If you've never really played it before, it's kind of hard to figure out what to buy and what to play. That's why I always recommend just purchasing a bunch of common cards at the beginning and then figure out what your play style is before you start spending a ton of money. You might be kind of wasting your money because you don't understand exactly what it is that you need to do um, moving forward. So figure out what you like with common cards. Then you can move on to those uncommon rare and mythics. Also, in general, the complexity of the cards seems to increase as you go from common to uncommon and then from uncommon to rare and to mythic. So sometimes there's a lot of text on the cards that appear if they're rare, um, and that's kind of by design. In general, you're not going to see a ton of those being played, and the mechanics are a little bit more difficult to understand. When you hit the rare and mythic tiers for deck building, in general, you might only have you know a couple of these rares unless you really, really like it and you want to invest heavily into that, sometimes the rares go from anywhere from like a dollar all the way up to hundreds and hundreds of dollars, depending on what set, or even thousands of dollars if you go way back through time to some of the original sets. So this, this can be extremely cost prohibitive, and it's just not a good way to get into the game. Next up, we have the Mythics, and if you're opening booster packs, you'll probably get some of these from time to time. They're extremely rare, but they're kind of fun to play. So in general, when you're first starting your deck building, you're going to be focusing on commons and uncommons and maybe throwing in a couple rares and maybe a mythic here and there. So now that we've gotten money cost out of the way, next we're going to move into mana cost. And this is a really important lesson in deck building because it'll keep you alive, especially if you're a new player, and it'll allow you to play the game. If you don't construct your deck very well, you're going to get wiped out and annihilated pretty quick and you're not going to learn much of anything. The more that you're going to learn is because you're going to stay in the game longer and you're going to have those cool battles and those cool interactions with the other players. So here's something I recommend. Sometimes people fight with me on this, but I think with new players, this is a great way to keep your deck mana cost effective. So on the left side of the screen, we have a Dryad, and it only costs one mana to bring out. So kind of what I want you to understand is sort of this bookend philosophy. On the right end, we have a purple worm, and that cost is pretty high. It's at a seven. So it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to bring out a lot of purple worms. And oftentimes what I see players do is they look at just the power and the toughness on the creatures, and they say, ooh, eight, seven. I'm going to just completely load my deck with big creatures and big monsters. The problem with this strategy is often you will be defeated before you can even bring out one of these, let alone a whole entire host. Um, consequently, on the other side, I see players sometimes say, you know what, I'm just going to power load with a bunch of really cheap and um, kind of low power and toughness creatures. I'm just going to swarm my enemy. That's a great strategy, but sometimes that's hard too. So what I recommend for new players, don't put more than four of any one casting cost um, cards into your deck and then on the other bookend you want to cap this at five casting cost so find some sort of creature 
that is either five or more and only put four of those into your deck at most. So, you know, maybe you want to play these trolls instead with a five casting cost. So if you have four cheap cards, four expensive cards, what that means is the rest of your deck is going to kind of fall into the middle and they're going to have casting costs anywhere from two to four mana. And that's really kind of where the sweet spot is. So at most four cards of one casting cost and at most in your deck, four cards with a five or more casting cost. This will allow you to stay in the game and learn the mechanics and make you a better player. All right, let's put what we have learned to the test. So I've got my land cards. I'm doing a blue and black deck for this video. So I've taken the 11 of each basic land type and stuck them in this deck. And then over here, I've taken my 30 creatures and then I've mixed eight additional cards. And that's a mixture of instants, sorceries, enchantments, and artifacts. I've mixed them into this deck. And now what I wanna do is um, make sure everything's thoroughly randomized before playing. So I went ahead and I just um, quickly shuffled this deck. And then I also quickly shuffled all of the other cards in. And kind of what I recommend doing is when you're putting your deck together for the first time, just grab two cards, throw a card underneath, grab two cards, throw a card underneath, and go ahead and continue this process. You're going to mix that land into this deck. And then when you're done, you're going to shuffle it anywhere from three to five times, depending on how good you are shuffling. And then we're going to move on to testing your deck. This is kind of a weird solo strategy that I've used for a very, very long time to make sure that your opening burn, which is the opening hand that you have, and all those cards, you can play them down effectively, and you don't have any sort of mana bog down. So I'll show you what that's like in a second. All right, now we have our deck. Everything is sufficiently randomized. I went ahead and I shuffled that land in, and then I went ahead and shuffled this deck five different times just to make sure everything is sufficiently mixed. Now I'm going to kind of test the efficiency of how fast you can bring stuff out in this deck, and I'm going to do it by kind of a simulation aspect. So I'm going to take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cards off the top of the deck. And what this is simulating is my opening hand, essentially. And I'm gonna go ahead and just take a quick look at that and make sure that I have a sufficient amount of land mixed in, which I do. So I've got a swamp and an island mixed in there. Uh, now what I'm going to do is simulate the opening of the game, just kind of by myself. And I'm going to just practice playing down the cards. So I'm going to imagine that I'm the first player, so I'm going to skip my draw phase. Next, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to expand this out a little bit so you can see what's happening. I'm going to put a swamp down to simulate my first turn. Then I'm going to pass to the second player. Now I'm going to simulate that I'm starting my second turn. And I'm going to look into my hand. I'm going to play an island down. And then on this turn, I'm going to play down the secret door. Then I'm going to pass the other player. I'm going to simulate now starting my third turn. And I'm going to look in my hand. And now I've got a Sepulcher Ghoul out as well. So now I'm going to pass on to the next turn. Um, now I'm drawing a card. So now I have three lands. And uh, now I'm going to simulate playing a instant, which is Bar of the Gate. This is an enemy counter spell on my next turn. Now I'm going to simulate my next turn. And if you can look and see, my hand is beginning to dwindle, but I haven't really hit any mana bog downs per se when I'm running through this. Um, on this turn, I'm going to put one of these Death Priests down. Then on my next turn, we're just going to keep simulating this. And what I'm looking for is to make sure that I can get stuff out effectively and that I'm eventually going to run out of cards. And you can kind of simulate what that looks like. Now I've got another turn. I'm going to simulate, you know, playing two different instants down on that next turn. And I'm going to untap everything. And then I'm going to draw. And then on my final turn, I can play out the last two cards in my hand. And as you can see, it's a pretty efficient deck. I didn't hit any points in time where I couldn't play stuff. So every turn I'm playing something down and moving forward. And that's kind of what you want. Now, when you're done doing this, just take all your cards and throw them in the discard pile and then start the process over again. So just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then simulate another opening burn with this next set of cards. And as you can see, um, we have a nice another set of opening cards that we can play. So do this and run through the entire deck 
and do this a couple times. And what you're looking for, like I said, is just make sure you're not getting stuck. If you have any sort of mana problems, it might indicate that your creatures are a little bit too heavy to be bringing out. If you run out very quickly, that might indicate that you have too many small cards that you're bringing out. Like I said, you want the sweet spot. You want those sort of mid-range mana cost two to four spells to get out, and you want to get them out effectively and efficiently. Here's another quick tip when you're done playing the game, and this is something that just I see a lot of new players do, and it absolutely jacks up their next game, and it makes it not much fun. So what I see a lot of the players do is they just take all their cards, and they've got some a bunch of stuff in their discard pile as well. They just pile it in here, pile it in here, and throw the land on top, and then shuffle it once, and then let it rip again. Now what's going to happen is all of these land cards are not going to be really well distributed. So kind of what I recommend again is you take two cards, put a land behind, take two more cards, put a land behind, two cards, a land behind, and you just keep doing this process. Any extras you just mix into the middle. That just means that prior to shuffling, all of your mana is properly um, sort of distributed in this pile of cards. And then flip it on top, shuffle it anywhere from three to five times, depending on your effectiveness and your efficiency. And then you're ready for the next game. I can't tell you how many times I see new players, they don't even shuffle their deck, and then they end up with these crazy land problems where they draw one land card and they have one mana to play, and then their opponent just slaughters them. That's not much of a fun game. So what you can control as the player, you can control that your deck is sufficiently randomized. So I suggest doing this every single time. Kind of get into... Um, the habit of doing it, it's really fast and, and effective, and it'll make your next game a lot more fun. All right, so now you are an effective Magic player. Maybe you've played three games, I don't know, and you're feeling kind of good about it. Uh, maybe you've won a couple, and maybe you're starting to get the hang of it, and you understand that um, when you have a nice board presence, it means you got a lot of stuff out on the board, and you can make a lot of moves, and you can control, essentially, the other player, and you can control the flow of the game. And then let's say you get done with those three games and now you're ready to run into another set. Kind of what I recommend doing after about every three to five games, especially if you have a new deck, go ahead and just go through it. So flip it over, look through it, see what cards you like, see what cards you don't like. And since this is a customizable deck game, you can put whatever you want into your deck and you can take out whatever you don't like. So this is a fantastic opportunity to tweak your deck. A lot of players kind of get stuck in the mindset of, oh, I'll just go ahead and tweak my deck when I get home. So they'll go to the game store for like three or four hours or they'll hang out with a group of friends for like four to five hours and play a bunch of magic. And they won't tweak their deck until they're sort of at home, um, kind of like having some downtime. What I recommend is go ahead and dive right in just take a break after three games and say, you know what, I'm just going to tweak my deck a little bit. So go through and make, maybe, you know, you've got a set of these clattering skeletons and there's four of them in the deck and you don't necessarily like them. Go through your collection, find something you do like and then replace them. Make sure you sufficiently randomize everything back into your deck and then go for another round. What's great about it, this concept is that you're constantly tweaking it and you can make your deck more effective in a much quicker manner if you just take a couple breaks when you're playing and customize your deck as you go. Sometimes people don't like doing this because they have such a huge collection of cards they don't want to bring it with them. Um, maybe just bring like a small subset. So maybe you're playing the newest set, you know, kind of this D&D set. Just bring those with you um, and, and tweak it that way. But take the time to invest in your deck. It's going to make the game playing a lot more fun. The other thing, too, is uh, make sure you play a lot of different players if you can. Uh, you're going to get stuck sometimes with just the same strategies you're seeing from your opponents over and over again. And that's going to make your deck weaker. Find new players, find new challenges, and then tweak your deck after um, playing those new challenges. You're going to find the game very, very rewarding and very, very fun. Although this isn't totally deck building related, I just wanted to make a note about this. There are some new mechanics uh, that I noticed in this set that I hadn't ever really seen before. And these are very Dungeons and Dragons oriented themes. So if you want to stick around, please do. I'm going to walk through kind of the fun behind it. First, there's treasure tokens. Next, there are quests that you can go on. Then there are character class cards. There's dice rolling included in this set. And then also some choose your own adventure style cards. 
these are all really D and D esque themes, which makes Dungeons and Dragons a lot of fun to play. So by understanding these mechanics in in conjunction with Magic: The Gathering, I think you'll get the full experience. So please stick around, and I'll walk you through all of the new mechanics. A new mechanic that appears in Adventures in the Forgotten Realms is the concept of dungeons. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through it since this is a new mechanic to the set. Some of the cards allow you to delve into the dungeon. When you see such a card, it will allow you to enter the first room of the dungeon or to progress through the dungeon itself. Simply use a counter. Now, you can choose which dungeon you go into, and that's pretty critical to your play style. And all of these dungeons are different. So when you get to enter into the dungeon, pick one of the rooms, and then you're committed to that dungeon. So as an example, if we go into the Lost Mine of Fandelver, we're going to go into the first room, we're gonna scry one. Then from this point on, if we progress further into the dungeon, we get to make a decision whether we go to the goblin lair or the mine tunnels. And then when we move into this room, then we have another choice of rooms and so on and so forth. Once you hit the end of the dungeon, that dungeon is considered completed. Once you are done completing a dungeon, you can go into another dungeon if you want to uh, work on that one and complete it. Note that some of the cards actually become more powerful in the game if you have completed a dungeon. So be on the lookout for these new cards and this new mechanic. Another new mechanic in this set is the concept of treasure. And there are these example token cards that are present that you can pull out of booster packs for this expansion set. Now, a lot of the different colors, there are cards that generate artifact tokens. And this is kind of what you're looking at. These are the treasure tokens. So what I commonly do is I just put them out onto the table and then to track the amount of treasure tokens I just kind of throw different tokens on top of this treasure card so I can remember what it does. What you can do is you can sacrifice this artifact and it adds one mana of any color. Please note that this is extremely effective at getting out some of your larger heftier creatures or your enchantments, artifacts or whatnot in, into the game. So think of it as you can build up these treasure tokens early on in the game, and then you can kind of burn through them to trigger different effects. One of them is just paying for high cost cards. Other cards will actually trigger if they consume the treasure tokens. So be on the lookout for that as well. This is a cool new mechanic, and I think it's very effective. Character class cards are also included in this new expansion set, and these are very D&D oriented. You're going to find one for all of the basic uh, character classes that are present in the Dungeons and Dragons game. This one on the screen is the Barbarian, and you can level up your class or classes as you play the game. What's kind of cool about this is that when this card first comes into play, you're going to start at uh, level one, and then what you can do is you can pay mana to progress to level two and then progress on to level three, and this is going to give you cumulative effects for that character class. Please note that these must be played as a sorcery, so you can only do it on your turn. So you can't do this as a fast effect or an instance on another player's turn. But what you can do is progress through this and you get all these abilities. It's a really cool concept and it is very, very D&D centric. Another fun mechanic present in this D&D expansion set is the concept of rolling a 20-sided die when certain cards come into play or certain effects are triggered. As an example, we have the Sylvan Shepherd, and you can see that there's three different things that can occur when this Sylvan Shepherd attacks. What's pretty cool about this is that you get to roll the die and sometimes you're going to get a critical hit. Now, nothing is probably more iconic in D&D than rolling that 20 and the excitement that you feel when you roll it. In this case, when the Silver Shepherd attacks, you're going to gain 5 life. Now, if you roll the 1 through 9, you're only going to gain 1, but if you roll the 10 through 19, you would gain 2. So rolling that 20 has a massive impact on the game, and it's pretty exciting when you roll that 20. A critical aspect of all role-playing games is choices. The players are able to make choices when they play the game, and that definitely impacts the outcome of that game. What you're going to see throughout this D&D set are cards that are very, very choose-your-own-adventure based. 
when you cast the card, you get to make a decision. Sometimes it's two or three different decisions that you can make, and it will impact the game. I find this to be very thematic, and it's very much tied to the D&D universe and the feel of playing D&D. These cards are a great addition, and it also gives you flexibility when you put them into your deck. Depending upon the situation, you can choose the outcome and thus radically impact the flow of the game. To summarize this video, I went ahead and threw the basic deck building strategy up on the screen. Please know that this is just simply a place to start. It's a great way to build a basic core deck and then go ahead and modify it and customize it to your liking any way that you see fit. Hopefully you've enjoyed this deck building video. Magic the Gathering is an exciting card game. But really the most difficult aspect is the deck building part of the game. Once you get this under your belt, Magic the Gathering is fantastic and fun, and it will give you years and years of enjoyment like it has for me. I want to thank everybody for joining me today for this video, and as always, have fun gaming.